to now invite um, uh, uh, Emma uh, Hayward to do the first of our uh, presentations on mental health, inclusion, and spiritual wholeness. Okay, um, I hope everybody can hear and see me. Um, thank you for inviting me to be part of this event and thank you for the introduction, uh, Richard. Um, I'm Emma Hayward. I, I've worked as a GP uh, for a good number of years, um, both in Leicestershire and Northamptonshire. Um, if we move on to the next slide, um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself because it's sometimes nice to know um, who it is who's bringing um, the information to you. So um, I am a GP. I'm also married to Phil, who's a handsome chap in the back of that canoe. Uh, we've got three children. And as Richard mentioned, uh, we uh, attend Holy Trinity Church in the middle of Leicester. Um, as well as being a GP, I'm an educator at Leicester Medical School, which you can see up there in the top left. And I volunteer with an organisation called Prime Partnerships in International Medical Education, which is a group of G um, medical and nursing and allied health professionals who are all Christians, who are all educators. And we get invited to various places around the world, to many res resource poor settings um, to teach and support medical education. And we always do that with a whole person perspective. And so it's really with that sort of um, that value in mind that I'm speaking to you this evening. Um, so my job at the, the beginning of the evening is to set um, mental health care in a bit of a context. So I'm going to set it in the context of history and also in the context of whole person care. So we do the historical bit first. So you might recognize the proverb at the top there, a cheerful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit saps a person's strength. Uh, and that was obviously from the book of Proverbs, so probably written about 3000 years ago, but the writer recognized uh, that what happens to us spiritually can have an impact on our physical um, appearance and how we feel in our bodies. Anybody who's ever seen someone who's been recently bereaved will notice that they go hunched over, they look a bit disheveled, they just don't look themselves, it has a real impact. Um, and there was that Hebrew way of thinking. They had this idea of shalom, which doesn't just mean peace, but it also carries it with it, this sense of integrity and how everything is interconnected. So what happens to my body affects my mind, uh, my emotional state and my, my spiritual well-being. The idea that body, mind and spirit were different um, actually only came around with the ancient Greeks and only really became complete during the Renaissance, which is 1300 to 1600, so really recently. And that was the moment at which the arts sort of went down one route and science and medicine sort of started to follow a different path. So medicine became very scientific based around just the physical um, and we began to study it in that way. But we're now beginning to recognize that that biomedical model is lacking. So spiritual care is sort of being rediscovered by um, healthcare, by the World Health Organization, by NICE, by the NHS. Um, but the problem is, is that because we've been trained in the biomedical model, there isn't much expertise within many aspects of medicine. I, mean, I think palliative care and obviously chaplaincy services do include it. But in the general practice of medicine, um, we feel rather under equipped for spiritual care. Uh, so that is why we're looking to form more partnerships uh, and to, to share experience and ideas. So that's the context of history. If we now look at the context of the whole person, I just want to show you this model that um, Dame Cecily Saunders developed. So she was the founder of the modern hospice movement. And when they were developing hospice care, they began to realise that there were some people whose pain did not respond to um, pain killing medication. And Dame Cecily came up with this idea of total pain because they began to recognize that some people, unless you dealt with the other aspects of their life, their physical pain just would not get better. So there may be people who had social sort of pain, their worries about the future, they had loss of role and social status, and this enhanced their experience of pain. There may have been people who um, had a psychological element to their pain. They were depressed or fearful or anxious, and this made their pain feel worse. And there were people who had um, a spiritual aspect, so anger with God, loss of faith, um, feeling isolated or lacking in purpose. 
And that also contributed to their feeling of pain. Um, and so whilst today we're focusing very much on mental health, we need to remember how all of these bits are interconnected and we can't just deal with the one aspect without also considering the bigger picture. So on the next slide, I'm just gonna share with you a story. Um, obviously it's anonymized, it's not the real name of the patient. Um, but just think about this case. This is Alison, she's a single mum. Um, she's got two boys, age three and five. They live in a rented house, but it's not in great condition. The bath's leaking into the kitchen. There's no heating in the front bedroom and the front door is jammed shut. They just can't open it. Unfortunately, the landlord just isn't ma making any improvements or addressing any of these issues. And as a family, they have to use the food bank at times because they just can't get their money to stretch far enough. So have a think, what impact would this be having on Alison, on her physical health, on her mental health, on her spiritual health? I think the, the physical is, is quite obvious. They're, they're in a cold house. Um, that would, you know, doesn't feel comfortable to be in, perhaps a bit damp as well. Their nutritional state is not going to be good because uh, um, they're not going to be eating a really well-balanced diet with some fresh fruit and veg because money is too tight for that. So there's some physical effects. Um, but this is also then going to have an impact on her mental well-being. There's that constant anxiety. What if there's a fire in the kitchen? We can't get out the front door. The landlord isn't interested in helping us fix this. You know, she's concerned for her boys. Um, being undernourished and not being able to eat frequently um, also does begin to, and, and having constant money worries also impacts on people's mental health. Um, and so I think there's, there's going to be quite a lot of stress and not just for Alison, but I'm sure her boys would be picking up on it as well. And then spiritually, she's feeling abandoned. The landlord isn't interested. She may not have social support. Even, she can't even get her boys to um, play with their friends or to go to parties because they can't afford um, gifts to take with them. So overall, you can see that this social situation of poor housing and um, difficulty with finance is having an impact in all of these different areas. Um, and Alison's not the only person. So, you know, so if she came to me and said that she was depressed, there's a doctor, I could give her pills, but I need to look at that bigger picture. Um, and depression can happen to anyone. Um, poor mental health can hit all sorts of people. This is an artist's impression of the prophet Elijah, who'd done some amazing things from, for God, um, amazing miracles. Uh, and he was a man of faith. But after all these miracles happened, he had a real crisis. I mean, he really went to the, the depths of a terrible depression. And we find him here in the wilderness. And he says, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors who have already died. You know, in my opinion, as a GP, I would, I would count him as having a severe depression. You know, he's really thinking that his life isn't worth living anymore. So what good does God do? Um, if we just flick back to that previous slide, Florence, I'll talk about it for a little longer. Um, so I think sometimes mental health can feel quite complicated and complex, and it can be. Um, but I don't think that our response always has to be a complicated response. There are people who've got more expertise than we do, who we can refer on to. But sometimes our calling actually is to, to do the simple things in a loving way. So when Elijah's facing this terrible crisis, God doesn't do anything complicated. He sends food and drink, makes sure that he's, he's got a, a tummy full of food. He allows him to rest and have a nice sleep feeds him again and then he suggests a six-week walk in nature and that might be where we can come in we we can provide food and drink we can make sure that people are getting enough rest and then it might just be a way trying to find ways of helping to people to connect back with themselves to connect with nature and to connect back to God you know, we, we don't have to do lots of complicated things to care for somebody and look after them when they're having um, some sort of crisis. So if we move to the next one. So I suppose I want to pose several questions to you. This is the first. So what role do you think the, sh the church should play in relief of suffering? Because I, as a GP, when I see my patients, there are certain things that I can do for them. 
But there are certain aspects of their life that I'm not allowed to um, really touch on in our consultations. And um, one of the things that I found when I researched this amongst clinical educators, many of whom were GPs, is that they could recognize spiritual problems, but they didn't have the confidence that they knew where to send those people to ask those spiritual questions. And so I'm really passionate about seeing the NHS and the church working more closely together, getting properly trained up for this, and um, so that we can really care for the whole person and each do our bit really well. Okay, if we move on. Um, so th th I'm just going to show you just um, a couple of contrasting ways to care. I mean, we all recognise that NHS environment. It's very clean, very clinical. You've got lots of experts in the room wearing their different uniforms. They've each got their little piece of the jigsaw, their part in caring. But you notice where the patient is. He's, he's in the middle of the room. He's sort of stuck on a trolley. He can't go anywhere and nobody's looking at him. So they might be looking after him, but there isn't that sense of care and you contrast contrast that with this slightly blurry because it is a mosaic i think um this um slightly blurry picture on the other side which is of the ospedale de santa maria della scala one of the oldest hospitals where people were brought who were sick and diseased into a faith community and yes they might not have had modern medicine but you can see they're trying they're doing some foot washing and some bloodletting and they're discussing well what's working um in in the middle of the picture there uh, but even when the medicines won't work, you can see over onto the, the far left of the picture, there's a man who looks like he's dying and he's just being um, laid down, really cared for. You can see there's some, some um, eye contact with the, uh, the minister who's right on that side of the picture. And I just love that. You know, it's a, a way of caring within a faith community. So we move on to the next slide. We're going to have a look at another picture. Um, this is a picture I use in teaching all the time. Um, this is a picture by Robert Pope and it's called Mr. S is told he will die. And I just want you to notice where, where's the gaze of, of the different people in that picture. Mr. S has been told that he's going to die. He's, he's looking into the middle distance. He's really looking into his future. What does it mean for him? You know, where, where's, what does that mean? now that he knows that his days on this earth are numbered. But look at where the focus is of the medical staff. They're looking at him, doesn't look like they're talking, but they're alongside him and he knows that they're there. And I love this quote from a colleague, John Wyatt, who's a consultant in neonatal care in London. And he says, suffering is not a question that demands an answer. It's not a problem that demands a solution. It's a mystery which demands a presence. And so many times when we're faced with human suffering, whether that is physical illness or mental ill health, um, we can feel like oh, we don't know what to say. We, we haven't got an answer. And you're right, we don't. But actually, sometimes our calling is not to have an answer or to have the right words, but simply to be alongside people and to show by your presence that you care. We move on to the next slide. So I said I had a few more questions for you. Here they are. So I'd love you to consider, um, you know, perhaps talking with, with friends and colleagues. What role does the church have in promoting good health? Do you think that it has a role? Why or why not? What sort of health and social issues do we face? What, do you, what issues do you face in your area? What sort of things do we face as a nation? And how might the church, either local or national, promote physical health or mental health or social well-being? I'm sure many of you here have got groups and programs that you run within your congregations that would also benefit people who are not from the church. If only we could make those connections. And I hope that after this evening, you'll have a few more ideas to take away as well, um, as you think more in depth about how we can support people with um, difficulties in their mental health. And the last question that I'd love us to, to continue to discuss is what are the barriers and the facilitators to partnership working between the NHS and the church? You know, we, we've all got different areas of expertise, um, but I can tell you that the NHS expertise and looking after the whole person is, is really um, 
it's not lacking, but the, there is um, a lack of training and it's very difficult to deliver in the healthcare environment that we're currently working in. And we could really do with some really good partners alongside us to care for people in the way we want to see them cared for. So thank you once again for inviting me. I'm very happy to take questions and to be contacted afterwards if you wish. So thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Um... Emma for that and uh, as we've been saying if you want to put a question then do put that in the chat and um, I'm going to now uh, look to uh, Emily's just going to share an example of one particular uh, wellbeing cafe that's running just to give us an idea uh, an example of a practical uh, way in which one particular church is reaching out. Um, Emily over to you. Thank you. Uh Hello, hopefully you can hear me. I think I've unmuted. Um, as Richard said, my name is Emily. For those of you that weren't here, bang on, bang on seven. Um, it was supposed to be uh, somebody else, Sarah, speaking on this this evening. Um, I happened to I happen to live in the same parish and go to the same church as Sarah. Um, she needs to not be here this evening. And so I have happily stepped in and I'm speaking on her behalf. So if I'm glancing down, that's because I've got notes. I'm not being rude. Um, so yes, I'm going to talk uh, about a well, a place of welcome, a welcome place that uh, was set up in Great Glen. Um, I'm going to start pre-pandemic, pre-COVID, if we can even remember life pre-COVID. Um, and that was a monthly group that was ran by um, our pioneer curate here, um, and they had a growing team of volunteers. Um, that practically looked uh, like chairs, tables, and they would sort of share a meal. Um, and that was a, as we said, a monthly group. There was initially no sort of spiritual element to that, um, but they were starting to get to a place of encouraging sort of a prayer time or some sort of short reflection. Um, and then COVID hit. But the heart behind that group and where it all came from was to tackle loneliness, um, which uh, in this this particular village, but I, I would be bold and suggest maybe as you know, stereotypically British, it's a bit of an overlooked topic um, just because of being very British and not wanting to talk about it. Um, so they wanted to really tap into that and tackle that. Um, if you then fast forward post COVID, it's more recently uh, relaunched um, and retitled as sort of Cuthbert's Coffee Cakes and Conversations. This again was happening monthly um, and that attendance was getting anything sort of up to 15. Um, this looked uh, a bit a bit dialed back due to various barriers, but this was more looking like a couple of volunteers, hot drinks and a place to chat and sort of be safe. Um, this then grew alongside the cost of living crisis um, to encompass a warm space. Um, so over the winter, I think from about November, this then came alongside a warm space and they sort of merged. So it became twice monthly that the church building was open as a warm space and as a place of welcome. Um, and it started to encompass more things we'd have um, sort of some snacks out. We didn't want to just do sort of cake and a hot drink, but wanting to do something slightly more nutritional um, within within the barriers that we were facing. And so things like toast or crumpets or fruit or pastries um hot drink you know the vicar would be there once a week we have once a week they'd have toys out to try and um if there were maybe families or people caring for young children that were isolated and lonely at home um struggling in a cost of living crisis that they were sort of a place for kids to play as well um this also happened alongside the community pantry that was set up at church. And so we were finding people were coming in to use the community pantry because they couldn't, you know, go and get food. And then as well as that, we were able to, because, because they'd come for that, you can welcome them in and like offer them the hospitality and the conversation. And um, again, focus a bit more on that whole, whole person care and talking to them and just giving them a bit of time. Um, I am told that uh, the people that set that up worked with the local parish council and local doctors to send out invitations for people to let them know that that is there and available to them. Um, so I think that was really helpful to invite key people and to tackle key pockets of loneliness, I suppose. Um, some of the challenges that have been highlighted were that when it was initially once a month, that's the nature of that, the unpredictability of that, struggles to build a bit of momentum um 
and to you kind of then struggle to maybe build those relationships. Um, this is a village here. And so sort of in the nature of village life, you naturally bump into a lot of people a lot of the week anyway. So some of that is tackled um, just by the, the fact that this is a village, but elsewhere, a consideration might be that monthly might not be regularly enough to have those relationships and to build up that pastoral care. Um, and the ongoing aim of that group is to continue to grow the volunteers and actually for the volunteers to ultimately hold responsibility for it. Um, and they want to bring back in some sort of Christian sp spiritual dimension to it, um, but very much want that to come from within the group, not not from like a vicar prescribing it or something so sort of we want them to take ownership and work with the church team work with the clergy to come up with that internally um hopefully i've done that justice thank you very much indeed i mean you did indeed do that justice and um uh, i really appreciate you bringing something of a real life example into our gathering um this evening uh thank you uh we're going to move to our third a presenter after which we'll have an opportunity for some initial questions and answers and um, we'll then have another question and answer session after we've heard um, our last two speakers so i'm going to invite uh, sarah fagredo to share with us something about renew well-being thank you sarah well hello thank you for having me um i'm going to tell you uh, by way of telling you a bit of the story of renew well-being um, our founder ruth rice who lives here here near where i live in in nottingham um, was the pastor of a local church and uh, she will tell you herself so I'm not betraying any confidences here that she experienced a, a catastrophic burnout and a mental health crash and she says that she spent a year lying in bed watching Dallas reruns um, as, a, as which gives you an idea of what was happening to her and she spent a lot of time reflecting on her experience she she loved the church that she was working in it was a super church so this wasn't something that the church had done to her but but she recognized that uh, part of the the cause of her breakdown was the pressure that she was under as a church leader and the pressure to work ridiculously long hours and i think that's something that as as church leaders we we need to pay attention to is how we care for ourselves but also that, that she recognized that the church was, was doing its very best to respond well to her and to love her, but actually some of the things that they were doing just weren't helping her situation. And, and she was also experiencing, and I think what, what those us, many of us who've had mental health problems who are Christians have experienced that we're expected to be living in the joy of the Lord. So why am I so depressed then? Um, and and you know so you could feel ashamed that that you felt like that like you did but also there was the pressure that people were didn't know what to do so they would offer healing prayer and they would say oh no let me pray for you but then that added to the problem because when she wasn't healed she couldn't go back and say i've still not been healed so she was she was experiencing in the in the loving concern but the practices of what the church could offer that it wasn't helping and so she she's and she also was finding trouble engaging with God um, and, and she comes from a from a sort of uh, evangelical brethren and Baptist tradition. And so the ways that she would have traditionally engaged with God weren't helping her. And out of all of this experience, this reflection and this struggle, she realized that she wasn't the only one experiencing this. There were a lot of people around who were struggling, who were lonely, a lot of people outside the church who had nowhere to go with this who didn't feel safe going going to places or who often when they went to places were just a diagnosis and so out of that experience and working with her church here here in nottingham she developed a place called renew 37 which uh, she describes as a safe place where it's okay not to be okay mm. this is uh, a place where uh, she she wanted people to be able to come and uh, develop habits of well-being. She came across as, as part of her explorations, the five ways to well-being, which is a kind of globally recognized uh, set of things that people can do. And actually, as she looked at those, she thought, well, actually, these, these things, this connecting, this learning, this getting active, taking notice and giving, 
the church at its very best can offer all of that to people. Um, and so she she kind of brought that into the mix. She focused very much. It's really interesting to hear Emma talking about shalom. Um, we we talk about well-being at Renew Wellbeing. It's, it's in the name. Um, and seeing that as as this this biblical shalom, this wholeness of body, mind and spirit that that comes to us, not in isolation, but in community with each other. So we we you know, it's not just take some tablets that will affect your brain chemistry it's the whole the holistic human being and so when I was listening to Emma I was I was wanting to shout amen yes absolutely you're absolutely that's what we think as well um but the ways that, that the church can care for that and and trying to find ways that the church could be present uh, with people who were struggling, who could uh, could acknowledge their own struggles and their own well-being issues, and say, actually, uh, I need to stop. I need to have habits of well-being as well. So the 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 atmosphere in in Renew Thirty Seven was that there were gentle hobbies, uh, the dreaded well-being colouring. You either love it or loathe it, I think, don't you? But but you know those kind of quiet things that enable people to feel safe. That there were things to do it wasn't an encounter group where it was very intense and talking to one another uh, you could learn new skills and there was a, a strong element of co-production so it wasn't just uh, the leader bringing uh, bringing something for people to do it was well what do you do what can you share what you know if you're doing your crochet bring your bring enough to share and to teach somebody else um and she ruth all was trying to create this place where people could consciously develop habits of well-being and for her uh, as a Christian that included a habit of prayerfulness um, and so she wanted to find a way that that prayerfulness that spirituality could be a strong thread running through it so she she refined this model into something that has uh, our three p's she is at heart a Baptist pastor so three things three points all beginning with the same letter and uh, these are our, our values in Renew Spaces. And the first one is, is being present, showing up and being present to one another. So putting your phone down, doing something together, um, you know, sharing in an activity, doing things alongside one another, <sighs> connecting with one another as you do that and building community together. But doing that in a really authentic way, um, where you're being with each other, not it isn't a thing that you do too. Um, and uh, I, I particularly love the work of, of, of the Anglican priest, Sam Wells, who, who writes so eloquently about the need to be with people, not to do to them. Because I am a, I'm a Baptist minister and I have lifelong uh, depression. And I, I shouldn't say that because I should be okay, shouldn't I? But I'm not. So being present, being alongside each other, acknowledging that that some things can't be fixed but that we can be together in it and journey together in it um there was also wanted ruth wanted to have a recognition that the church doesn't have all the answers to this and actually if we if we overclaim what we can do uh, we can do harm so mm. we need to be really careful that we mm -hmm. aren't uh, leaping in with with counseling and so on mm. um so partnership with other organizations with the nhs with the local uh health community with other charities i'm pleased to say that that i uh launched a renew space when i was a pastor in leicestershire and leicestershire county council really really loves renew well-being spaces there is a lot of support at a very high level uh in leicestershire for this if if you want to talk to me i'll i'll come on to that at the end but this partnership thing that we we invite others to come and partner with us. So some of our renew spaces, the social prescribers come along, bring people that they're working with along. They know that this is going to be a safe space. They get it. And then the final P, and for us, the most important P is, is prayer. At the heart of every renew space, there is a prayer space, a quiet, gentle space where anyone can go if if they're feeling stressed in the moment or just thinking I just need to calm down for a moment they can go and sit in that space no one will come and and rush in and go are you okay they'll they'll be left to uh, relax and and do whatever they need to do but then a rhythm of of led prayer 
very simple prayers that are done in a way that enable those who don't know how to pray to join in with prayer. And that's done in a very uh, low pressure way that ensures that people don't feel obliged to join in with that. So that's not done sort of in the group that's done. And this is going to happen over here. If you want to join in, you're welcome. But we do this as Christians. This is what we do to to help care for our well-being. And, and we have a lot of stories, my own space uh, up in Northwest Leicestershire. Uh, people loved to come into that time because it was so quiet. It was peaceful. Uh, we used to do what, if you're a Christian, you'd be familiar with a, a thing called an Ignatian uh, prayer of examine. We did that, but in a way that made it accessible. But people really appreciated time to slow down, to reflect on their day, to express thankfulness. And so those three P's are at the heart of what Renew Wellbeing Spaces are all about. Uh, and what we as a national charity do is support churches to set these up. Um, I just noticed someone said they missed the second P. That was partnership. So it's presence, partnership and prayer. And, and what we do is support churches to set up a Renew Wellbeing Space, uh, a simple space, low stress, don't turn it into a huge extravaganza of craft activities and knitting projects just for people to come along and uh, and share hobbies of well-being to find a community that is safe where people won't judge you if you have a diagnosis but you don't have to have one if you're just lonely or you just want to do something to care for your well-being uh, to come along to it and we offer um, sort of training and help and support ongoing in doing that um, we were running, uh, it, we started in 2017 uh, as a national charity. Uh, there were seven Renew Spaces, mainly in the East Midlands. Uh, my space in, uh, in, near Colville was number seven. The beginning of lockdown, we just thought, what are we going to do? We have all these people that are relying. We now have 50 spaces. People were relying on this space. It had become part of their lives. But we're pleased to say that through, uh, through lockdown, more and more churches were coming to us and saying, we, we can see this, we need this. People were doing it in Zoom. It was, it was bonkers. The whole thing was bonkers. But, um, and now we're up to 250 spaces across the country and more coming along every, way, um, every day. I'm pleased to say that there are seven Renew Wellbeing spaces across Leicestershire, for those of you who are in Leicestershire, but uh, none in, in Church of England churches yet. Um, but that would be great to... to uh, hear from people. As I say, we have this strong partnership with Leicestershire County Council, and they're really keen to support uh, this initiative. Uh, as was mentioned, part of my role is I'm I'm working nationally across all these spaces to develop uh, a model with young people. Uh, we have some groups with young for young people doing a very similar thing uh, all across the country. And the thing of the moment, the thing that I've spent a lot of time on this week is talking to people who are recognizing the need uh, for toddler groups, for something for, for parents who are struggling, for whom a toddler group is, is just not quite enough or just not quite the way they need it to be. And so, and I'm thinking there's, there's a God thing happening here around toddler, toddler groups. Um, and uh, so that's, that's something that's bubbling under as well. We want to, to help families to together to develop habits of well-being um, to sustain them. Uh, we work in partnership with another charity called Sanctuaries Ministries. They, they do have courses to help churches think well about mental health and well-being. And I would really uh, commend their courses to you and get in touch with them online. Uh, but that's what Renew Wellbeing is about, is about having these places of presence, uh, working in partnership uh, with prayer at the heart of them, but done in a very gentle, calm, uh, quiet way. That, that's what we do. Uh, I'll stop there. Thank you very much indeed, um, Sarah. Um, that's a, a really helpful presentation uh, there, uh, which will in a little bit link well to you referenced um, clinical prescribers. Will, our next uh, pre social prescribing will be, um, our next uh, contribution will be from David Snart. But before I introduce David, we're going to just have a checking on whether there's any uh, questions that are coming on the chat that might be appropriate to um, to put to our speakers. Um, Florence, I don't know if you had any there. Uh, 
Yeah, so a well, question for Emily is, was the community pantry linked to a food bank? Uh, hello, okay, um, again, I'm speaking on other people's behalf. Um, I will answer this to the best of my ability. Um, the short answer is no, it isn't, so it's not a food bank. Um, it is a community pantry. It was set up to um, tackle food poverty, but also food waste. So it was almost 50-50 in terms of environment and food poverty, wanting to tackle both of those. Um, the, there is a sort of philosophy of, I think, give, swap, take is the slogan. So you can give to it, you can swap from it, or you can simply take from it. Um, it's so it's it's the different the main difference for a food bank is it's like it's sort of anonymous unless there's other people in the building when you go to use it or if you're there at a time of the um, loneliness cafe warm spaces no one will know you've been um that's why partly why the warm space loneliness cafe is there because you want you want we we wanted to make sure we are making that con conversation connection to then signpost people on so it's almost like a stopgap or a stepping stone um it's it's a short term thing for food poverty we can signpost onwards um or it's about reducing food waste swapping things um yeah i hope that's answered so it's not a food bank it's it operates quite differently to a food bank the principles are similar in one sense different in another sense um we do have very nice relationships with local food banks but in itself it is different i have put a link to uh a diocesan story about uh, the Great Glen uh, community pantry. Um, and uh, so uh, another sort of general questions from a few people have been a bit to find out a bit more about renewed wellbeing. So how do people find more about it? Um, is it possible to visit one to see how they work? That kind of thing. Uh, yes, I've put a link in, in, the, uh, in the chat with our ma map of where all our centres are. Um, if you would like to talk to me a bit more to learn a bit more about uh, Renew Spaces, then I put my email address in there and I'd be delighted to hear from you uh, if, if you want to talk more about either uh, a space for adults or for young people or children or toddlers or whatever. So do get in touch with me at sarah at renewwellbeing.org.uk and, uh, and I put the link which shows you on a map where all our spaces are. Um, I would say if you are going to visit a Renew Space, uh, do get in touch with the lead host. Uh, sometimes you can end up with uh, lots of people visiting to have a look, and that that just can be a little unsettling for the folks who are the regulars there. So just uh, get in touch, touch to check. Great, and with that, I think that's all our questions so far. So. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Florence. Um, and so, as I was saying, linking neatly from what Sarah was referring to earlier, um, the topic of social prescribing is now something I'm going to invite uh, Dr. David Smart to share with us. David, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. I think you can all hear me, which is, is good. Um, so if you just um, pop up my slide, thanks ever so much. And so I was going to just start a little bit with um, the, the Guild of um, Sim Raphael um just to tell everybody about this 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 course which you're looking at at now really is part of a section of a, a the guild of saint Raphael, which has been around for 100 years linking health and faith together and the key thing that the, the guild had was to actually um really bring in the sense of healthy healing hubs and the opportunity that i want to think of as, as emma has really challenged this is could the church actually be that center of healing and that's what the Guild of Health have, have done um, in, in, in their course. And um, so I was just hoping, Florence, there was a couple of uh, slides before this one. I wasn't sure. No, nope, it's okay. Don't worry. Don't worry. I think um, if you go back to the beginning. They're right the... at the end. Sorry, let me just. Oh, okay. They're right at the, uh, the other end, are they? Yeah, if we kind of, you're seeing, you're, you're getting an advanced preview, guys, of, of um, where we're heading. Um, so what I'm going to head into is this. So yes, if we go back to the that first slide, that's where I was expecting to be. So um, so the Guild of has been around for 100 years, but in all four Gospels, this sense of Jesus' mandate to go out into the world, make disciples, and to heal. And so it's really at the centre of the Gospel. And I think the Guild have been trying to find ways of doing this, 
but in the context and really in relation to science. So this is this real opportunity of um, the, the church linked to science. And really, um, so if we go to the next slide, this is the, what I was just talking about, these healthy healing hubs. And they, at the heart of this, um, is a project to have a course, which is a four session course. And one of the things that we're going to be um, talking about is an, an extension to the course um, around um, links with social prescribing. So if we now have that slide, next slide, which will have Gillian just giving a bit, a one minute um, video of the, 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 um, the Guild of Health, I think that's going to come. Well, we're just kind of working on it, but there we, here we go. We can't hear that at the moment, Florence. Uh, don't worry, this is when technology escapes us. So let's go back. So I will tell you through, I will talk you through what um, uh, Gillian is really just describing the opportunity of how it's difficult for us at the moment um, in, in, the, in, in the church, but how there's this real opportunity of how we can reach out with the course and how this is at the center of the gospel and the course availability. So now we go back to the beginning of my slides, which was the first one you showed, the aims and objectives. This is a course which is we're offering um, as a way to churches, as a way of um, extending how churches can link with social prescribing. That's And this is something that I and an OT colleague, and both of us are members of a church community in, in Northampton, um, but at the start of um, this, I should say that I'm also a, um, as a GP, we employ about 30 to, I look after a federation, we employ about 30 to 40 people in Northampton town who are social prescribers covering um, the town. So we are a provider of social prescribers, and we're looking to how we can link people to what we call community assets. So what we, this is what we cover in the course what is social prescribing, how you can access it. So I'll talk a little bit about what social prescribing is in a moment. Understanding these are things, I'm not going to cover all of these today, but we cover in the course, understanding the health context, where it's come from, where it's going and opportunities. And then we think about what does the church have to offer? And I'm going to give you an example of what we've done in our own church of St. Giles in Northampton. And then really how to make these links. And I think as, as uh, Emma was describing, what are the, some of the questions and barriers that there may be um, for, for how we can link? So next uh, slide, please. So what do, what, who are social prescribers? They usually sit in a, um, a varying uh, position, often in the health context. So nearly all GP practices will have social prescribers now in their uh, practice or linked to them if provided by another provider. They support people, what matters to you, what matters to me is the key thing. Rather than in medicine, and I've been a GP, it's often what matters to the GP or that medicine, medical model. This is a real social model. What matters to me? So it's actually putting that co-production, that real onus of partnership working, um, doing with, not doing to. And it's supporting this center of control, people taking more control of their own health and well-being. And if I tell you the NHS makes only 20% difference to health outcomes, behavior change, 30%. So our own behavior makes much greater change to our health than does the NHS. That's an important point. But it links people to the wide range of non-clinical activities, as you can see here, singing, maybe, just talking next to each other, as we heard earlier, going for walks, walks and talks, noticing in nature. Different opportunities to link into the community and link with community partners. Next slide, please. And really, one of the things we've done here, Renew Wellbeing, you heard about the five ways of wellbeing. Those are the same as the first five here, which are giving, relating exercise, awareness and trying out. This is the 10 keys of happier living which is promoted by Action for Happiness. And I like this because it has meaning in here. One of the keys is meaning, that sense of spirituality. And it's the only framework I know which has a, a bio, thinking about our bodies, a mind, thinking about our mind, social, our social context, 
and our meaning. And I've done a, a sermon on this at my, my own church. Um, but this matters to me personally, because I've had my own experience of depression and anxiety, despite my research, despite all my learning. Yes, doctors get it too. And so I've had my own experience. I had to go to my GP two occasions. And for 20 years of my career, I had what I'd call a deficit model. The last 10, I've had this asset based. What's right with us? And that's much more a positive psychology. Mm. Approach. And um, the 10 keys, <laughs> each of these, we like our acrostics. These, each of these first letters relate to that. So that, that's uh, another way of looking at it. And um, so next slide, please. Lots of work, Action for Happiness, is, by the way, is an international charity, and you could look at them, www.actionforhappiness, F-O-R, happiness.org, and there's lots of resources there and talks. Um, they're not a Christian charity. They're non-faith, but that means they can also be used by Christians to reach out to people, and that's a lot of what we've done in our own church. Just to let you know, social prescribing came out of a church. So Bromley by Bow is often seen as the heart of this, Sam Everington and others, but it was started by a vicar with a diminishing congregation. Many of us have that. And this need to reach out, well, we've all got that need. Common mood disorder is now the commonest cause of disability worldwide. So the opportunity to reach out into mental health is a real need. If you want to know what your needs for your community are, that is it, made worse by COVID. But he actually recognized that the health wasn't delivering what it needed to combined with health and that's the, the origin Bromley by Bow, really where social prescribing came from next slide please and it comes to this whole person approach we keep hearing this the shalom I see that as right relationship right relationship with our maker and right relationship with self that relationship we have with contemplative prayer really embedding that then we can give to others. We can put the oxygen mask on first so that we can then, if the, oxygen, if the plane's coming to crash, you put it on first self, then you can give to others. So our right relationship with God that we can give to others, but we need it to be sustainable, sustainable, filled with the spirit, love, prayer, and scripture. So that's the sense of what we're trying to promote. And I think that's a consistent message you're all getting from all speakers. And the next slide, please. And so really, what did we do? This is um, what we did at St. Giles, was really set up a group to do this type of thing, to really sense what was going on, gather lots of information, what was going on, and map into the community. Ooh. If you go, yep, next, just click. Then to think what we're going to deliver. And then really, we, we listened and thought, what are the things people are telling us? And these were some of the things people were coming up with. This is what we heard and from the congregation. These are some of the things people wanted in the well-being of Jesus at the heart, God at the center, and a church of action to develop this well-being hub. And really to reach out to people in need, reach the vulnerable, but the foundation, as we've heard from Renew Wellbeing, um, and we are a Renew Wellbeing cafe site, um, is that foundation of prayer, but to connect with each other. So the aim was really to think, what's going on? We have a Renew Wellbeing Cafe. We have these toddle in, and we have Manor House as a Christian counselling service. We also have a bereavement course. So we're already providing a lot of op offer to the community, but it's mainly just to the church. Could we think of how we could offer it out to the wider community? And this is uh, part of the thinking. So actually, what we wanted then to do was then to think, what are our next steps? How are we actually all going to come together and make connections to build a well-being hub? This is one model. There's another model in town that have done it as a big conversation. But um, I'm going to stop there. But I think hopefully that's an opportunity to create some debate and to help you think about links with social prescribing. And the best way you can link up is just to go to your local GP service and ask, how, how do I link with my local social prescriber? Thank you very much indeed, um, David. And as we've said with the other speakers, uh, do please put some questions into the chat, which we'll look at in a little bit. As we come to the end of our seminar this evening. Um, if you'd like to put to David on the material he shared uh, with us um, and one or two of the other questions that have been coming in just now, um, which we'll be able to put uh, to any of the other panel as well. 
but our final uh, speaker this evening, we're going to switch across to now, uh, which is uh, Alison uh, Davis, who's going to share with us about spiritual support for people in specialist mental health services uh, and together with their families. So um, thank you, Alison, for being with us. Over to you. Okay, it's really good to be with you um, this evening. And I'm just so encouraged by everything um, that's been said already. And um, I work as a chaplain, um, a Church of England chaplain at the Bradgate Unit. And I'm just going to share with you something of my story. Um, and I like to start off really with uh, three questions whenever I'm doing anything like this. Um, so the first question is what? Um, and I'll just tell you a bit about my background. Um, I grew up in Birmingham and my mother had um, a serious mental health illness. And so I became, um, as we'd call today, one of the young carers, uh, myself and my sister were termed young carers. So we have that term today, don't we? But we didn't then. And it was so important that I had my siblings around me at that time when my mom was going through a very difficult time in her life and su suffering as, as she did. Um, but it did bring us as a family closer together. And that is something that I'd just like to point out that it can actually have a positive effect on families in some ways because they can be brought closer and certainly in my um, own situation, we were brought together closely as siblings. And then I'd just like to mention the importance of the contact with our Christian GP, who was the first Christian I'd met because I come from a non-Christian background. And the connection there with our GP was that my mom used to go to chat to him and his wife, who was also a GP. Um, in the local surgery and she had such a lot of support from them both that um, and we gained support from them as a family too so I'd just like to echo the importance really of the role of the GP in supporting um, people with mental health conditions and indeed their families um, and finally yeah just to say that it's really important to support families um, of people who are experiencing mental health Ill illness. Just to go back to um, COVID, just for a second there, my interest in spiritual care came when I was working at um, Birmingham Women Women's and Children's Hospital. And we... Um, we had COVID come along, of course, as we all, all did. And I remember asking myself the question, what everything around us has changed. Everything has become more, more difficult, but what hasn't changed in this context? So um, I'd just like now to, to talk a, a bit about spirituality because spirituality is something possibly that doesn't change um, if we think about what's going on on the inside of each of us. It's something that we can turn to and really explore. Um, and I just wondered um, how you would look at spirituality yourself and what your own definition of that would be. So that's just a question over to you. Um, how would you define it? Um, it's become a, a real topic in the healthcare profession. And so we have a definition here by um, Dr. Christina Kulchowski, who is talking about, I think, um, David, you were talking about meaning in terms of social prescribing and the importance of a person to seek and express meaning and purpose and the way they experience connectedness to the moment and 
to themselves, uh, to others, to nature, and even to the sacred as well, to explore that in terms of their spirituality. And in terms of asking ourselves these questions first, because we can often talk about people with mental health illnesses, but actually this does come first to, to us as individuals and looking at our own self-care to ask these important questions of ourselves. So those are just three really important questions to ask about yourself as you um, explore spirituality, as you explore supporting others in their mental health. Um, and here is an activity that I might use with um, a patient at the Bradgate. Um, and it's called the caring tree. It's an example of a spiritual care activity. And so first of all, just to think about the caring tree in terms of the leaves, um, I might ask a patient, who are the people um, that you tend to confide in? Who are the people that you might turn to when you find things becoming difficult in your life? And we sort of look at the caring tree in terms of people writing um, their names on leaves and decorating our own sort of caring tree, which helps us to know that we have people around us that can support us at difficult times. Um, another question is, um, what um, interests or who lifts my spirits when I feel down, when I feel low? Um, and we can share together about those things that really help us when we're in a difficult space. So things like, I think, music tends to come up a lot for people that they will listen to their favorite tracks and it will tend to lift their spirits. Um, and then, you know, what are the interests or activities that help us um, for our own well-being? And really, in terms of my practice as a chaplain, I'm talking about helping, what are the things that are helpful in terms of a person's well-being? What helps them? And that is very particular to them as an individual. So I think the next slide, yeah, it's just to, just to have, a, have a think yourself about those things that are helpful to you in terms of those people around you that you speak to when things are difficult and situations you face are making you feel low in yourself. Um, and in terms of the roots of the tree, I would talk about self-care and what are those things um, that you do to help yourself, things that you can control, things, for example, like switching on some music or doing some gardening. What are the things you can take control of um, in terms of taking um, nourishment in from the roots of the tree? and also um, the leaves of the tree, making up our own caring tree. How does that look for each one of us? So just a couple of examples here. Um, as with the caring tree, we, this is an exercise in remembering. So when we're in a, a difficult space, it might be that we find it difficult to remember the better times and um, a patient that um, I was helping to support who suffered with bipolar, as we did the caring tree activity, she was reminded of those people that had helped her, that she could turn to, whether she was um, having a good day or a bad day, she knew she could turn to and they would be fully accepting of her. And especially um, talking to and sort of um, finding her pet dog was one of those um, one of those uh, things that really helped her to um, feel safe and feel better in herself. 
Um, and just the knowledge that she was unconditionally, unconditionally loved by people already around her uh, gave her a sense of hope and that some of these things she was already doing and she could find support from people already who were around her. And then secondly, um, Mark, I also supported at the Bradgate unit um, in terms of religious care. Um, and he, he had some kind of faith um, as a Christian. He was um, just exploring at that time about who God um, might be. And he'd, he'd got a close friend who'd shared with him his experience of the Christian faith and was really supportive of his mental health. But in his experience, he was still being bothered by nightmares. He'd been in and out of prison for a long time. And we just prayed, he asked me to pray for him. And God is really in those spaces. Um, and these are real opportunities where God is powerfully at work in people's lives. And I'd just like to encourage you really to um, know that God is there in the midst um, and his presence is there for people who are experiencing quite severe mental health illness. So um, in terms of wrapping everything up then, um, in terms of my role as a chaplain, I see it as affirming the person I'm speaking to, whether that is um, a mental health patient or whether it's uh, a member of staff who are caring for the patients, um, to help people to know right there and then that they are accepted, that um, they are loved, and just to affirm them in the person they are right at that moment. Um, also, um, we are as chaplains here to care for the spiritual well-being of others and to be a presence, absolutely, to, to be a presence alongside, which I think I've already been hearing tonight, which is really encouraging. And to, to, do, to do things that we are already doing as churches and as people in churches, we are already sharing the, these kinds of conversations are going on already. Um, and just to talk a bit about my values as a chaplain would be to empower others to collaborate with um, people in my team and people to promote well-being and shalom. We have that word again. Um, and just to ask ourselves as individuals, as churches, what are our, our own values that we really want to bring into action here to um, help people in their mental health right where we are in our churches, in our parishes? And how, how do we um, demonstrate our own self-care? Just reflect a bit about our own self-care and what is working for us and how we're able to share that with others. Um, and this is just a quote from Henri Nouwen, um, who a lot of you would have heard of before, um, to, to share that compassion with others is a difficult thing, can be a very difficult thing, um, but to show that sol solidarity with others, we also have to look after us, ourselves first and and to share that greatest gift that we've been given to support and to care for others. And then any questions? So thanks ever so much for listening um, and I'm happy to, to answer any questions anybody has. Thank you very much indeed, um, Alison, um, and uh, for sharing that. I'm just re reflecting on what a extraordinarily rich and varied uh, series of presentations uh, we've had uh, this evening. Um, obviously, we can't cover everything um, by any means, but um, a, a good balance. And I can see from some of the questions coming in uh, that uh, you know we will be able to explore some topics in the final 15 minutes that we have uh, remaining 
to us. Um, I mean, initially, if, uh, uh, we'll see whether Florence and Emily are able to identify any questions that arise specifically from our last two uh, speakers, um, David and, and Alison, um, and then perhaps look at some more general questions that are coming in. Florence. Yeah, so one, one question um, to all speakers is, carers are often left behind in the shadows and feel isolated, time poor, exhausted and prone to illness themselves. What do these models offer to carers? Okay, I'd like to go, go first with that. Can I go? David? Uh, David? Yeah. Yeah. So um, firstly, I've been a carer and my father's had mental disorder and I, my daughters have. And I think it does run in families. So that's the first thing. And secondly, um, if you are a carer, you have a doubling the risk of, of mood disorder. So yes, there is a risk that it will affect. And I think it is inheriting us to kind of reach out. And I think Alison in her last bit was just describing that Henri Nguyen's quote at the beginning does say, in the middle of it, said something about the carers, how we need to think of our own needs within how we care for others. But I think for us who are have agency and ability to recognize and we are okay that we need to reach out especially to those people who are caring intimately for people who are not okay and i think that's a real opportunity and that's something i've tried to champion certainly in the health services locally okay yeah emma yeah i mean i think social prescribers um would take a referral from me as a gp if i said you know, I found somebody who potentially had carer stress or was at risk of carer stress. Um, they would welcome the opportunity to link with churches who might have a carer's cafe um, or other things that were open. So if you're considering what you could do in your community, it would be worth talking to your, your local health services and saying, you, you, do you have people who are, are carers? They certainly will. Um, what facilities are there for them? What do they need? Because it may be that your church could step up and meet a real need um, for carers or young carers potentially um, and again it doesn't have to be something complicated it can just be a place of welcome and um, somewhere where people can come they can have a chat or they can not chat um, somewhere just to have a bit of a break from the the stresses of, of caring and I really can't emphasize enough that the value of community I think often when we when we're part of a church community we forget that people who aren't part of the church community often don't have anything so sometimes I am the only person who chats to, to somebody for, for 10 minutes because I'm their GP. They'll come and talk to me. That'll be the longest conversation they have. I had a patient once who used to make cakes so she could take them to her neighbours and have a two minute doorstep conversation. That was how lonely she was. Uh, and so anything we can do that provides a place of welcome for carers um, or for people who are lonely for other reasons um, will be a brilliant and wonderfully healing thing. Yeah, Sarah. Um, we really welcome carers and their carees, if that's the right word, uh, into renew spaces. Um, you know, pe people in renew spaces, uh, they're there as people with, with all their complexities, but often because it becomes a community of care where everyone is caring for everyone, the, there's a sense that the, the carer can step back because the whole community is looking after that person. So I visited with a, a, a host uh, in a church and she brings her father with Alzheimer's and she knows that the rest of the room will look after him, uh, not in an oppressive way, but she can relax for a moment because she knows that, that he, is, he is being welcomed. And she had the uh, lovely experience of noticing that he, uh, although he was quite far gone in his Alzheimer's, uh, someone had said to him, oh, that painting you're doing, that's very good. He was teaching them because in his, it, he, when he was well, he'd been an art teacher and he'd lost that. But in that moment, suddenly he was back to, she had the joy of seeing her dad again, teaching people how to paint. And he had the joy of doing it. But that came out of the Renew group. And I think that that was a special thing for her and, and that he felt that it was his group, but it was also her group as well. Yeah. And we've got one more question about uh, depression has been one of the, um, the condition mentioned most this evening, but what about other ones, um, maybe severe mental illnesses, so uh, BPD, schizophrenia, etc. And um, this might be a good one for you, Alison, given your work at the Bradgate. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I see patients with um, lots of different um, mental health il illnesses, including um, schizophrenia and uh, bipolar, um, all different, lots of different types of illnesses on the more, you know, severe end of the spectrum of mental health il illness. Um, so, but still, this this person's spiritual self is there and um, it, it's uh, I find that just speaking to patients just about their everyday um, experiences and how, how they're doing that day is just as important just to explore with them that might even turn into a spiritual um, conversation about how they're doing in themselves and um, that day and um if if they do feel that um you know they're being punished by you know god or you know those sorts of questions will always come up and uh, i'm just there to listen really that's my main role is is to listen to people in that kind of distress and to for them to talk about whatever it is that's on their hearts <clears throat> at that moment really and just to explore with them the the truth um, um, about um, where they're at and just to help support them in knowing that they are um, good in themselves, they are good people, whatever they're experiencing, <clears throat> whatever's happened to them to um, uh, put them into a difficult place, that they are still a good person and that they are loved. And I find um, a lot of the time, if people are experiencing mental health illness, often they are isolated. Often they do not have one or two people that they can turn to, one or two people on that caring tree. And then it will be um, up to myself and other members of staff who see them every day, just to explore with them, well, who are the important people um, and you know um, you know we we can help to sort of try and establish relationships and friendships that are helpful to that person and um, to so that they don't feel so isolated and then i think that is all the questions so i'll hand back to you richard thank you very much indeed and um uh, before I uh, thank our speakers uh, for this evening, um, I, I, I think uh, Florence, we're, we're hoping that we'll be able to provide some of the resources that uh, we've identified here, uh, be able to send them out. Is that right? Um, yes, that's right. Uh, probably not tomorrow, but hopefully next week I will send uh, everyone who signed up with an email um, the uh, sort of a document with lots of resources you can look to. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and yes, we hope that this will be uh, a, a step, as someone said, uh, one of our presenters said earlier, getting us thinking around this. And as a uh, within the diocese, we have a social responsibility panel that I'm privileged to chair, uh, which brings together people involved in different areas of care and loving service in the world, um, uh, and which we have got a, a, a mental health subgroup. Um, and we're wanting to connect with parishes and churches in the initiatives they're having, as well as partnering, obviously, with some of those wonderful organisations that have been represented here this evening that can give resources and can uh, give some visioning for the kind of initiatives that we can be doing in our own context to uh, generate um, support for those uh, with different kinds of needs and highlighting that as someone pointed out there's a whole uh, spectrum of different kinds of needs that apply in this case and also the carers i was really struck um by uh, just the the reference to the kind of the organic um evolution of care in some churches um that uh, some of the speakers were referring to as being that enables some carers to uh, have a bit of a break and um just reminded of how much is involved in culture change here within our, our churches of recognizing we all have a part to play on a Sunday morning. We can do so much uh, that can, if we have an eye to those who need a bit of a break, who have an eye for those who need a listening ear, 
And so this is perhaps the first step in that way, and we want to offer more. So if you have any ideas for that, if you want to be uh, following up some of the initiatives uh, that are being offered by the different organizations, so when the email comes out from Florence, please do uh, follow that up. But uh, to conclude, I want to thank our speakers this evening, um, Emma, Emily, uh, Sarah, David, um, Alison, and of course, Florence, who's been in the background uh, enabling us uh, to hear and see and to be connected uh, to one another. We've had a lot of the use of the word uh, also of shalom and wholeness and peace. And so as we conclude, and as I express our thanks to those who've shared with us, uh, we pray for peace for one another. Shall we just hold a moment's quiet as we pray for one another? And then I invite us to share in the words of the grace together, if you would wish to do so. As we hold before God, perhaps thinking around that care tree, the people who we give thanks for, who are there for us, as we think about how we might be on other people's trees of support, as we think about the ways that God might be calling us to be exploring within our own churches new initiatives, or the ways in which we would seek refreshment and need to speak to others about the needs that have been highlighted for us this evening. So we pray for God's peace on top and through us and between us. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of, love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, evermore. Amen. Thank you very much indeed for being with us on the call and look forward to seeing you again soon. God bless.